This video introduces the idea of imaginary and complex numbers. Now, imaginary is somewhat of an unfortunate choice of terms because it implies that these numbers don't really exist. Well, they do, and they serve a very useful purpose. So our objectives today are to provide some evidence that imaginary and complex numbers belong, they are legitimate, they are genuine numbers, and then to introduce the complex plane. Now, I'm going to do this very briefly, but you can find a more lengthy exposition of why imaginary numbers are real and their role and the development of them over history on YouTube in a series that I've highlighted here. So let's start with a brief review of the numbers that we're familiar with. I've drawn a number line here, and I want to start with positive integers. And we use positive integers for counting objects. Now the idea of zero comes into play to represent nothing. Now this concept took quite a while to take hold in mathematics, and it emerged in the 7th century AD in India and in the 1100s in Europe, according to some of the historical sources that I consulted. So if you want to solve a problem where you have n objects and you subtract those n objects, then you end up needing the number zero. So we had a new problem here, a new concept, and we needed to add a new type of number that went beyond simply counting objects. Similarly, we can extend the types of numbers we work with to negative numbers. And that allows us to deal with concepts of debt and to solve algebraic problems like x plus 5 is equal to 2. And then you can throw in rational numbers, ratios of integers. So if I have a problem like 3x equals 4, the solution to that involves a rational number. And then there's irrational numbers like pi the volume of a sphere, it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. And pi, of course, is an irrational number. It cannot be expressed as a ratio of integers. So that's yet another type of number. So the pattern here is that when we have a new problem, oftentimes we end up needing a new type of number. I want to pose a very simple problem, and that is, what if I have x squared plus 1 equals 0? And I want to know what values of x satisfy that. Now, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that this is a second order polynomial and therefore it ought to have two roots. However, there's no rational or irrational number x on that number line that I drew that will satisfy this equation. The closest you can get to zero is by setting x equal to zero, in which case you're left with the rather unsatisfactory situation of one equals zero. So clearly, if we're going to solve this kind of equation, we need a new type of number. And that's where we're going to define something called j, which is the square root of minus one. Now, if you have a math background, you're going to be used to seeing this being represented by the symbol i. But in electrical engineering, we tend to use a symbol j. So j is the square root of negative 1. And if I substitute this number into my equation, this problem that I'm trying to solve up here, I see that I have j squared, setting j equal to x, plus 1. Since j is the square root of negative 1, j squared is minus 1. And indeed, I've managed to solve this problem by introducing this number, which is the square root of negative 1. And this number does not occur anywhere on the number line. And you can see that from this definition, there's some other properties that this number has. In particular, if I look at j cubed, I can write that as j squared times j. That becomes negative j. Similarly, j to the fourth, I can write as j squared times j squared, and that's just minus 1 times minus 1, which is 1. So from this definition, we can derive some very simple properties of this new number. Now this j, or the square root of negative 1, is called an imaginary number. That leads us to things like 5j, or negative square root of 2j, 10.1 times j, and so on. All of those are imaginary numbers because they involve the square root of negative 1. And this is a really unfortunate choice of terminology 
because it implies that these numbers don't really exist. They're somehow in our imagination, but they're not actual numbers. They really do exist, and they serve an extremely useful role in engineering and mathematics for solving certain types of problems that we couldn't otherwise solve without this type of numbers. Now, a lot of times, we have to have a mixture of number types. That is, we have a mixture of an imaginary part involving j and another part of the number which is we'd find on our regular number line. For example, if you wanted to find the roots of x squared plus 2x plus 2, you'd end up with x being equal to negative 1 plus j or x being equal to negative 1 minus j. Both of those are solutions. So these numbers, we call them complex because Part of them is an imaginary number. Now, when you get to these complex numbers, there's a very, very useful representation that's graphical, and that's to introduce the idea of the complex plane, which I've drawn here. The idea is that you graph the real part of a number on the horizontal axis, and then the imaginary part, or the part that's associated with j, you graph on the vertical axis. So if I have a number x, that's a plus j times b, then the real part of x, which we'll denote by taking r, e, and then braces around x, that real part is going to be equal to a, that's the part that doesn't involve the j, and then the imaginary part is the part that involves the j. So I m of x, the imaginary part of x, will be equal to b. And this number x, I can graph this in a complex plane as a point with real part having coordinate a and imaginary part having coordinate b. When we only were looking at real numbers, we had the number line, and we could put numbers along a line. Well, with this new type of number, imaginary number, these complex numbers that we need to solve certain problems, we can graph them not on a line, but in a plane. If z is negative 1.5 plus 0.5j, that is going to show up with the horizontal coordinate, the real part being negative 1.5, and the imaginary component being 0.5. So that's this point in the complex plane. Now these imaginary and complex numbers satisfy all the rules of mathematics. For example, we can add two complex numbers. So if I have a plus jb and I add c plus jd, I end up adding a and c. And then the j I can factor out of the b plus d term. I end up with a complex number whose real part is the sum of the real parts the individual numbers, and the imaginary part of that number is the sum of the imaginary parts of the original numbers. In all of what we're doing here with our rules of math, you can think about j as being a variable or a symbol for a variable. And then at some point, we can use the fact that j squared equals minus 1 to simplify the problem. So if I multiply two complex numbers, a plus jb times c plus jd, so multiplying two complex numbers simply involves taking care of all the products. I have a plus jb times c plus jd. I'm going to have to multiply a times c. That gives me this term, ac. Then I'm going to multiply jb times jd. That gives me j squared bd. Then I'm going to have jb times c. That's jbc. And then I'll have a times jd, which is this last term I've written here. And now we can use the fact that j squared is equal to minus 1 to rewrite this as ac minus bd plus j times bc plus ad. The real part is ac minus bd. The imaginary part is bc plus ad. If we do an example, let's let x be equal to 3 plus j4 and z be equal to minus 1 plus j2. The product of x and z is 3 plus j4 times the quantity negative 1 plus j2. We'll multiply all the various terms in this product to get minus 3 plus j squared times 2 times 4. That's going to be 8 minus 1 times j4, so that's minus 4j plus 3 times 2j, or 6j. Simplifying, we have j squared is minus 1, so that's going to be minus 3 minus 8 plus j times the quantity 6 minus 4. So combining these terms in the real and the imaginary parts, we see that we get minus 11 plus 2j.